noticing I'm missing an adapter. So I'm gonna have to switch to the PC on the fly here. But hopefully it shouldn't be a problem. All right, so um, just to finish up in terms of our timeline, we'll be looking at um, Civil War, the, um, and finishing up with Reconstruction in the, let's see, we have three class periods left. Um, I'll hand out the final a week from today and uh, also go over the preferred answers from the midterm and hand those back to you. Yeah, I came from a meeting, so I wasn't able to bring those today, but um, yeah. Adapter, we'd be going right now. It seems to have gotten separated from my gear somewhere in my travels. But I can also do the lecture from here, too. Do you have a thunder? You do. Great. So, the cavalry has arrived. The cavalry has arrived. Because saving, saving my bacon. <laughs> I appreciate it. Start. Turn on the monitor. <laughs> there we go. Okay. Week nine, day two. There we are. Um, I'm calling your attention to the book uh, to make our world anew and the graphics that I made reference to the other day, just up front. So, the Negro in his own country. So, there's a concept from film. Spike Lee talks about it. Uh, the concept is called visual grammar. So, if a picture is a worth a thousand words, then what does the picture say to you when you see it? And then, what are the effects when you see it? When you see portrayals of violence, when you see portrayals of sexuality, when you see historical representations, what are they, all right? So, the Negro in his own country, right? So, brother man is sitting there only in shorts, he's holding a spear, there is a skeleton laying in the grass next to him, I'm not sure what that is about, since most human cultures, and definitely most African cultures, particularly if they're a Brahmic religion, bury their dead. And when I traveled throughout Africa, one of the things that was pretty clear, whatever the cemetery was, whether it was a Muslim ceremony, cer cer cemetery, a Christian cemetery, basically they buried their dead, usually at least six feet for a while, right? And sometimes in Africa you'll see, uh, for example, where there's termite mines, mounds, right? Termites basically go where bodies are because bodies are, decomposing bodies are 
fresh source of protein, food, or whatever. I mean, even though termites eat wood, but you will see termite mounds above where bodies have been buried, right? So in any case, this is from a book called The Bible Defense of Slavery, published in 1853. Now, a biblical defense of slavery. Now, just think who would be writing the Bible like that? And who would use the Bible as a defense of slavery? And who would be enslaved? I mean, so there goes, you know, lots of different things. So the idea then, if this is the Negro in his own country, and then below it, the Negro in America, which is basically the Negroes, as they we were called back then, are sitting in a parlor that's upper middle class, you know, with carpeting in their room, Western garb, and Massa is uh, lecturing to them. I mean, and this is very similar to a classroom setup, right? In the English-speaking world, where you you know you have the teacher who is supposed to be assumed to have the be the repository of all wisdom, speaking to the class, and there he, there he is. And then within this, then a plantation owner and his family attend church services with their slaves. Slaveholders try to use religion as a tool more to more fully dominate the lives of their slaves. Well, okay. And as Asante had pointed out, certainly uh, Christians were not the only ones who do that. The Arab forms of Islam also did this within Africa as well. So religion as a tool or weapon, if you want to see it that way. So, to talk about uh, the new Jim Crow, basically the old Jim Crow, it was a figure from minstrelsy, but it was also a system uh, based on not only the Bible, but other um, cultural uh, belief systems that basically said that you're not only a second-class citizen, you're going to be permanently inferior, so we're going to create a social structure to make sure that that inferiority or that second-class stature is enforced by law. So the civil rights movement in starting in, you know, whether you believe it starts in 1492, whether you believe it starts in the 1850s or the 1820s, or, you know, in the 21st century. The new Jim Crow, as it's been characterized by Michelle Ander Alexander's book, you know, what holds the new Jim Crow together is that, uh, I'm just starting with the, old, the new Jim Crow and going back to the old Jim Crow and basically highlighting some of the features. What holds it together is the belief that some of us are not worthy of compassion. And there's a vast new racial undercast exists invisible to those of us with jobs, houses, etc., in the virtual prison that they live in. And others are basically essentially put in a virtual prison, just like the old Jim Crow. So in the old Jim Crow, it didn't matter that you were a black person with a college degree. If you lived in the South, they could pass a law to forbid you from using your college degree or even learning to read, making that illegal. So that basically affected your upward mobility. <clears throat> the mass incarceration of poor people of color is the moral equivalent of Jim Crow, as um, Michelle talked about in her book of the same name, The New Jim Crow. Rather than use racial labels, we label, label them criminal. Then all the Jim Crow memes become just as viable, but now devoid of race. So the new Jim Crow, okay, we don't talk about race and racism, even though Jim Crow was basically about reinforcing and normalizing racism. But in the new Jim Crow, we take that out. We just refer to them as criminals. So, more as um, John Legend talked about at uh, the, um, was it Grammy Awards or the Oscar. Oscars? Yes, the Oscars. More black men are incarcerated today <clears throat> then we're in slavery in 1850. Sure, definitely it's crazy. But 
you know, when she talks about how this is achieving. So, and there's also, you know, what her piece is, it's not just incarceration or under control of corrections. In some states, they allow that if you have a felony record, you can't vote. All right? So more black men disenfranchised today than in 1870. And at that time, 1870, which we haven't exactly come to, is like right after Reconstruction when the Voting Rights Act was created, giving us the vote. I mean, so Selma, you know, the movie Selma, that movement was basically talking about, okay, we constitutionally have the right to vote, but you're not letting us vote through various means. So in the new Jim Crow, if you count prisoners as people excluded, so if you count them as people, so excluded from poverty statistics, 80% of black men in Chicago, for example, are relegated to permanent second class status. And it's a racial caste system, really, than a justice system. So in 30 years, the prison system quintupled the largest number of incarcerated people in the history of the world as Common made reference to at uh, the Academy Awards. And black incarceration rates have soared regardless of the crime rate. So war on drugs and the get tough on crime movement, where crime becomes a racial code word. So for example, uh, torn from the headlines, which I didn't build the lecture around that, but the federal investigation of Ferguson. So basically, if you know, I mean, I get parking tickets here, I get speeding tickets here, but the F Ferguson, basically, if you don't pay your parking ticket, you get put in jail. And then they add more fines, so, right, you get put in jail and you lose your job, uh, how are you supposed to pay the ticket? Too bad. So, they basically do traffic stops and that has been basically feeding their government economy and basically disproportionately targeting black people, where black people are getting, you know, five times the tickets, and, you know, and 80% of the arrests and incarcerations were being less than half of the population. Or, you know, even 60, I think the actual number was like 60% of the population. So, how is 60% of the population generating 90, upwards to 90% of the arrests and incarcerations? Um, Hmm, that would be deliberate discrimination, right? So, nationally, drug convictions have increased a thousand percent, and more people have been incarcerated today for drug offenses than in 1980 for all offenses. Now, when we talk about, you know, as a drug counselor, drug addiction is a medical problem. So, why do you criminalize a medical problem and whose medical problems are criminalized and whose are not and what is the logic that drives that I mean it's not the science and it's not the numbers so for example is this the dead blue pen more or less did we talk about Ronald Reagan and just say no okay sociostructural violence we did talk about that right no? Okay. When we study systemic discrimination, usually the science for that comes from the people who've been discriminated against. Like, for example, you don't see laws that are disproportionately affecting women change until you get women lawyers and judges. Make sense? Right? But in order to have women lawyers and judges, you actually have to have women allowed to go to school and read and write to so see how those things build upon each other. Right? So when Ronald and Nancy were saying just say no, 80% of illegal drug users <coughs> made in excess of $50,000 a year. So that's Congress. Yeah, and mostly 
you know, as Eddie's tapping his nose, cocaine. You know, because Robin Williams even said, you know, co cocaine is God's way of telling you you're making too much money. So, m white men, 80% of the illegal <coughs> drug users in the country, this is during the Reagan administration, and this is basically confirmed by scientific studies, so the National the Household Survey, where you call people up and, and on a <coughs> day and honestly report their drug use. So, I mean, they report household income. So if you're a white male making in excess of $50,000, you're using illegal drugs, mostly cocaine, weed, et cetera, et cetera. 13% of those, of the illegal drug users, are white women. Okay, so now we have the 93, in Just Say No era, 93% of the country's illegal drug users are white people. All right? So, of the 7% who are obviously then minority, 4% of those are Hispanic, and 3% are black. And there is a small percentage of others like Native Americans, Asians, etc., etc., right? But, but guess who's doing the time? Guess who's getting arrested? Okay, so it's not, you know, where we look at, say, either the movie Crash or we look at um, that movie with Michael Douglas and Topher Grace where, you know, let's see, um, traffic. traffic, that's it, right. Basically, that's real world, okay? It's white people using crack and sometimes black people selling it to them but may or, they may or may not be using them, but in any case, the numbers are basically saying 3% of the black people are using the illegal drug, but you know where the incarcerations are being driven are basically sales. And so you have some interesting things happening where, for example, um, a, a gram of what I'll call nose, or powder cocaine can be rocked up into 10 to 15 rocks of crack, which can be sold each depending on the market, you know, 25 for Eugene or 50 for New York or whatever, right? So you could get felony possession for possession of an ounce or less of crack, but less than five years for possession of half a kilo, which is basically one pound of cocaine. So since the difference between cocaine, no, powder cocaine and crack is baking soda and water, which potentially is a more dangerous amount to possess? 500 grams or 28? Well, guess who has the 500 grams, usually, who gets caught with lots of weight? And guess who gets caught with a small amount? And so there was no real sense in terms of the logic, in terms of the dangerous society, to charge the black crack possessors more than, le with more time and give less time to the white holders of a lot more weight. But that's the way it was administ administered. So when we talk about socio-structural violence, that's basically systemic discrimination. It takes certain form forms and patterns outside of the logic. So within the new Jim Crow, so part of what is driving those offenses, go to slide please, thank you. Part of what's driving those offenses is getting tough, but not getting tough on where the actual problem is. And every time, you know, as DEA, DEA agents pointed out, every time they did go after Wall Street stockbrokers who were actually actual users of cocaine and you know, whose basically drug use is feeding the drug problem, they were stopped politically, even when they were federal. So, you know, when DEA, which is federal, raids Wall Street, 
then the mayor of New York calls up and says, stop it, wait, how does the mayor interfere with a federal investigation just because he's, and we're talking Rudy Giuliani as well as Bloomberg, as well as Koch, as well as all these other folks. So, part of the new Jim Crow, just like the old Jim Crow came out of the South, the new Jim Crow is part of the Republican Southern strategy to get tough. Democrats, like Clinton, promoted and expanded the strategy to get white swing votes. That is, state and local law enforcement can get cash for numbers, not conviction. They can seize property and cash for suspicion, not conviction. Racial bias cases cannot any, can't even be brought to the Supreme Court unless you can offer evidence tantamount to an admission. That is, you actually have to have an officer say on tape or an email okay, that something that's racially biased. So for example, this federal investigation of Ferguson, where they're sending emails, officers of the court, as well as the municipal court, are sharing racially explicit jokes like, you know, well, Obama won't be elected to a second term because what black man can last long, last in a job longer than four years? Well, let's see, here I am 23 years later and doing this class 15 years in a row, but oh, oh, right. Or, you know, paying a black woman who has an abortion 5,000 from Crime Stoppers, like, okay, aborting your baby is stopping crime. Yeah, okay. All right, so if, if they basically brought a lawsuit against that, you know, then, and federally, then you, that's almost like an admission, almost. So the bias is that operationalized practices are unconscious and play out in enormous disparities. So effectively legitimizing permanent second class status, i.e. A, a new Jim Crow. So more than a trillion dollars has been spent on the drug war. And to counter this, there would have to have been a movement which ends all forms of discrimination and which enables basically the people subject to the new Jim Crow to access food, shelter, and jobs. So we've recreated slavery. So when you heard me say slavery has returned to the United States, this is one of the primary forms of its existence, not simply just this, but also basically sex slavery, and also forced labor slavery, too. We've recreate, recreated slavery in a caste system. So some of the solutions are basically like an un underground railroad for people who've been incarcerated. Basically creating safe places, so, for example, the Supreme Court of the United States, SCOTUS, said that it's not an Eighth Amendment violation to sentence a first-time drug offender to life imprisonment. So, there's a problem with the courts, too. And Thomas Clarence has not spoken out against that. So, restorative justice to take into account the victim, the offender, and society as a whole and restoring those relationships and healing them. So basically kind of like a new civil rights movement to counter the old uh, Jim Crow and the, for the new Jim Crow. So uh, the reason I start with historical scientific racism is a lot of that, those ideas come from this era that we're studying in the mid 19th century when we're looking at responses to slavery. <clears throat> So this came from uh, two black psychologists and psychiatrists, uh, Thomas and Sillen, in their book, Race and Psychiatry. And their quote is, in its long and ugly history in the United States, white racism has improvised a thousand variations on two basic themes. One, black people are born with inferior brains and a limited capacity for growth. And two, their personality turns, tends to be abnormal, whether by nature or by nurture. These concepts of inferiority and pathology are interrelated and reinforce each other. 
Both have served to sanctify a hierarchical social order in which the, quote, Negro's place, unquote, is forever ordained by his genes and the accumulated disabilities of his past. And we saw that in the visual grammar of the graphics. He's a spear chucker, right? The traditional corollary to that view, says Thomas and Sillen, is that black people function best when they, quote, stay in their place, that is, i.e., inferior to whites. And we saw that in the editorial from uh, the Oregon, the Salem statesman basically supporting slavery. Well, <clears throat> well, blacks are naturally lazy, even in hot countries and hot regions like the South, the rain in Oregon basically will make them even more lazy because it's cold, so we'll just do away <laughs> with slavery. And, you know, look, their natural place is subordinate to us and serving us, but no, we don't really want them here because it's cold and raining, they'll be lazy. Right? And so this is a commonly held scientific view, right? Social tasks and privileges normal to white men are too stressful for the black men. Blacks are living in unnatural freedom in the North, who are prone to insanity. Mental health was associated with contentment and a subordinate place in society. And protest was a sign of derangement. Now, when you see this being applied in other places, like you know, social dissidents in Russia, which used to simply be arrested and then put in a mental institution, now Putin just kills them. But we didn't do that back here. So, Dr. Samuel Cartwright, my fan, my hero. He's a white Southern physician who coined maladies which afflicted, afflicted runaway slaves. <clears throat> First, drapetomania, the flight from home madness, drapetomania gypticus. It was a mental illness that caused slaves to run away from slavery. In other words, you're mentally ill or crazy to want to escape slavery. <laughs> now he's serious. Really? He's serious. Okay? Because, I mean, let, let's look at the visual grammar of, you know, that particular. It's actually faster to go here. The Negro in his own country. How can, look, he's a savage. Don't even bury your dead. He's carrying a spear. That's a savage instead of a gun. Look, he's dressed for the weather there, and here he's got clothes on, like a civilized person. And he's being read to by the Bible. Or he's preaching from the Bible. Look, and look how he's dressed, and look how everybody else is dressed. How can you argue that that's not an improvement? Okay? How can you argue that? And so that's where they're coming from. Now, the logic, basically it's the logic that justifies inferiority, but, you know, there, there it is. So let's see. Trapezomania, is this the one? So, drapetomania, the flight from home madness, and diesthesia ethiopica, also known as rascality, by overseers. It was coined by overseers. Slaves destroyed property, avoided work, and raised disturbances with the overseers. Now, the reason that Sillen and Thomas are basically raising this as an issue with Mr. Cartwright is Mr. Cartwright is a student of Benjamin Rush, and Benjamin Rush is the founder of the American Psychiatric Association. Okay? Which, to this day, does not acknowledge that racism exists. To this day. Particularly, doesn't exist as a mental illness. So, when we talk about historical scientific racism, and we have Samuel Cartwright, who says, oh, well, slaves are crazy, for escaping slavery, which has obviously civilized them, and who would 
argue with that? Well, the slaves, right? So in the historical view of Mr. Cartwright and others like him within the American Psychological Association to this day, in the historical view of these scientists, blacks had smaller, less complex, and less evolved brains. This is the same argument they used for women, too. So one theory of racial superiority held that Caucasians or Caucasoids were the superior race that evolved after the biblical flood, as you noted in your, the midterm question talking about that. And third, continuing on from that idea, Sir Robert Downs, who Down syndrome was named after, basically <clears throat> held that Mongolism and Mongoloid features in people with that form of mental retardation were evidence of the inferior inferiority of Asian people. So who Downs was observing was white people who had fetal alcohol syndrome. Now, we didn't characterize fetal alcohol syndrome as a problem until the late 1970s. All right? So who is Downs looking at? He's not looking at Chinese people. He's looking at white people who have a form of mental retardation that we can trace to their overuse of alcohol in pregnancy. Because at this point, they didn't think of, there was, well, they didn't have a concept of addiction as far as alcohol was, and they certainly didn't think that alcohol harmed the pregnant woman or the pregnant fetus. So when people were born with that preventable form of mental retardation, and they had epicanthic folds, oh, well, a mongoloid idiot is you know, not just an Asian person. It is a, well, they have Asian-like features. Oh, well, that just proves that Asians are inferior. Wow. OK, that's kind of a leap of logic. But I mean, they're making other leaps of logic here, too. A whole bunch of them. A whole bunch of them. So today, while we call them developmentally disabled, there, we basically have rules about, you know, sterilizing people and eugenics movements and et cetera, et cetera. We can't have a Supreme Court decision that says, oh, well, yeah, it's okay to involuntarily sterilize people because we don't want any, you know, why would we replicate, you know, imbeciles more than three generations, if that, right? So even these views were widely held and formed official policy well into the 20th century. So when we talk about health consequences of racism on African Americans, uh, so 300 years of slavery, followed by 100 years of legally and socially reinforced apartheid, also known as uh, Jim Crow, supported by acts of terrorism, which only legally ended, say, 40 years ago or 50 years ago. So there are direct health consequences tied to types one, three, and one, two, and three forms of uh, racism, overt and covert individual and <coughs> institutional. There is disproportionate stress related to chronic diseases, for example, not only chronic diseases, but also how you deal with the stress alcohol and tobacco addiction being induced. So for example, when we talk about even though um, black people might somewhere under the low 10%, let's say now use illegal drugs. Black America is 12% of the population in the United States, we smoke 35% of the cigarettes. And the most addictive and carcinogenic cigarettes are marketed to us, that is menthol. In fact, if you want to see how this is reinforced, anybody who's been to prison or understands prison culture 
understands where cigarettes can be used as money. Basically, white people don't want to smoke a nigger cigarette, i.e. Salem, Cool, or any menthol cigarette because of this targeted marketing. All right, so black people, again, this is disproportionate. We're 12% of the population, but we're smoking one third of the cigarettes. Okay, and whenever you see disproportionality, there is a structure producing it. It's not random chance. And that's part of the whole concept of social structural violence. There is a structure producing those numbers. There is some intentional policy going on. It's not unconscious. So disproportionate stress related to chronic diseases and chronic diseases being related to disproportionate stress. So tobacco, tobacco hall, addiction, <clears throat> overeating, heart disease, stroke, diabetes, cancer. And so again, 13, 12 to 13% the population smoking 35% of the cigarettes, as an example. So when John Jacobs talks about, talked about more black people die every year from alcohol and tobacco, so let's say 60,000 plus, than the Ku Klux Klan killed in lynchings in its history. And that's just the documented ones. So you can understand, in terms of the new Jim Crow, we don't need the Klan to kill us off. The game is now we're induced to kill ourselves. A term I call autogenocide. That is genocide that you do to yourself. Okay, so because cigarettes and alcohol are used as drugs of choice for stress relief, mental health services are not accessed as frequently by African Americans for a variety of reasons. So the rare black drug counselors, the rare, you know, I'm, I may or may not have shown, you know, this um, article talking about my father, you know, when the, let's see, there were 150, he was interviewed, um, and at the time, I think this was like 65, 67, 68, let's say 68, uh, there were 150 black psychiatrists in the country then, in 1968, in the whole country, 150. So when black people are correctly diagnosed with any disease, it's usually at a later, more difficult stage to treat than whites, if it gets treated at all. And this phenomenon, form of socio-structural violence called health disparity, right? So health disparities, basically forms of racism. Type six, socio-structural violence. And the reason they're a form of racism is because at some point, they're structural, which meant that somebody created the structure to produce that result and maintained it that way. So when we talk about, in the 21st century, trauma-informed care, one of the things that we are acknowledging by that phrase is that trauma happens on a regular, predictable basis and so when we know people are coming from traumatic environments, we should adjust our attitudes and our services to meet the needs because it's predictable that they're gonna come from a, a certain form of trauma or multiple forms of trauma and health disparities are gonna be one of those things. So type six produces the largest numbers of negative health consequences, disease and deaths through the normal, seemingly benign structures and policies of society. So when you're talking about like a Michael Brown and Eric Garner, um, the kid who was basically killed in uh, Cleveland, and the uh, city government said, well, he was at fault because he shouldn't have had the toy gun, but, and they wouldn't apologize for killing him. When you have those kinds of situations, 
there, even as grievous as those are, that's a form of socio-structural violence, akin to uh, what we call extrajudicial killings, uh, also known as lynching. So socio-structural violence is designed, not accidental. And poverty is economic violence, which is also not an accident, too. I mean, this is basically one of the tenets of Martin Luther King. But we haven't gotten to that time period yet. But Judy Katz, where we talk about racism is a mental illness. So Judy Katz is a researcher and educator who identifies racism as a disease, a critical and pervasive form of mental illness. She says, racism has all the classic elements of destructive behavior, including acting out, denial of reality, projection, transference of blame, disassociation, and justification, all classic symptoms of schizophrenia or psychosis. And basically she's applying the definition of that particular mental illness gone from Western psychology. Now, of course, the APA doesn't Believe, doesn't want to acknowledge this because they say if we apply, if we say that racism is a mental illness, it's so pervasive throughout society, we basically have to decide that society is crazy. Well, yeah. So? Okay, we're not going to say that Prozac is going to cure racism, but maybe we can have some talk therapy for the people who are the targets of it. Let's start there. So one way, as uh, Katz talks about this disease manifest, is through the dilution of white superiority. The author states six studies dating from 1968 to 72. I mean, her book came out in the mid 80s. The dilution of white superiority manifests itself as arrogance coupled with a disdain for everything that is not white. It's perpetuated by deliberate omission falsification and emphasis leading to a belief that everything great that was ever done was the work of whites. And so how many famous African Europeans can you name? Well, more because of this class, right? <laughs> so if you never heard the term, it kind of proves the point, the idea that so Europeans of African descent, all of whom were held in some high esteem, but then also faced some discrimination. So Charlotte, uh, the Queen of England, Pushkin, Thomas Dumas, uh, the father of Alexander Dumas, Joseph Haydn, Beethoven, Saint Moritz, Angelo Solomon, and these are some of the folks that we've talked about within this class. So when we come to people like Harriet Tubman, because um, now we're basically in the run up to the Civil War. And uh, yeah, I'll talk about the Kambayi uh, River Collective. So, Harriet Tubman, um, how many people does your book say that she freed in the Underground Railroad? Seventy families or something? Seventy families? Okay. I'm not sure. I'll, I'll go with that. Seventy families? Say a family is like five people, all right? 70 times five is? 350. All right, so, well, I'm just saying, the idea is this. 350, let's say 350, is what she freed in the uh, Underground Railroad, all right? Now, she's famously quoted as saying that I have freed a thousand slaves. I could have freed thousands more if only they knew they were slaves. Now, is her math off? Because Underground Railroad, which is mo mostly what she's named for, <clears throat> or known for, was you know, only f freed 350 people, roughly. And why would she be called the general? Well, I'm going to tell you. The Kumbaye River um, action. So the Kumbaye River Collective 
statement is a black lesbian feminist statement uh, referencing Harriet Tubman's leadership as a model. And it's uh, the, at, at this particular um, web address, it's a feminist manifesto of distinguishing itself from mainstream feminism, where they're basically talking about, so an excerpt of that. We are a collective of black feminists who have been meeting together since 1974. During the time we have been involved in the process of defining and clarifying our politics, while at the same time doing political work within our own group and in coalition with other progressive organizations and movements. The most general statement of our politics is the, at the present time would be that we are actively committed to struggling against racial, sexual, heterosexual, and class oppression and see as our particular class the development of integrated analysis <coughs> and practice based on the fact that the major systems of oppression are interlocking. The synthesis of these oppressions creates the condition of our lives. As black women, we see black feminism as the logical political movement to combat the manifold and simultaneous oppressions that all women of color face. So today we call that idea intersectionality, that there are intersecting forms of oppression that interlock so and it's not like it's an oppression olympics so you can't say that a blind black lesbian muslim woman in a wheelchair is more oppressed than other folks because that gets ridiculous they're just saying that these interact there is not an oppression olympics it's basic or who's more oppressed than who, it's basically saying that these oppressions, these systems, interact with each other. So Harriet, the campaign on the Kumbaya, June 2nd, 16, 1863. The following <coughs> dispatch, quoted in part, appeared in the front page of the Commonwealth, a Boston newspaper on Friday, July 10th, 1863. Harriet Tubman. Colonel Montgomery and his gallant band of 300 black soldiers, under the guidance of a black woman, dashed into the enemy's country, struck a bold and effective blow, destroying millions of dollars worth of commissary stores, cotton and lordly dwellings, and striking terror in the heart of rebeldom. Brought off near 800 slaves and thousands of dollars worth of property without losing a man or receiving a scratch. It was a glorious consummation. So C Colonel Montgomery was handpicked by Harriet Tubman because of his <clears throat> activities with John Brown. So he wasn't killed with John Brown, but was associated with John Brown. And the fact that there were 300 black soldiers that under his command, picked and led by Harriet, basically this action up, as we'll read from this, uh, particular news dispatch. So again, if you've never heard of Harriet Tubman leading, being the military commander, a black woman general, essentially, you know, who handpicked Colonel Montgomery, you get, right, we have to question why is it that we don't know about this? So why are people tripping about women in combat roles in the military? Uh, we've had that happen. After they were all fairly well disposed of in the Beaufort charge, they were addressed in strains to thrilling <clears throat> eloquence by their gallant deliverer, to which they responded in a song, There is a white robe for thee, a song so appropriate and so heartfelt and cordial as to bring unbidden tears. The colonel was followed by a speech from the black woman who led the raid and under whose inspiration it was originated and conducted. For sound sense and real native eloquence, her address would do honor to any man and it created a great sensation. Since the rebellion, she had devoted herself to her great work of delivering the bondman, that's slave, with an energy and sagacity that cannot be exceeded. Many and many times she had penetrated the enemy's lines and discovered their situation and condition and escaped without injury, but not without extreme hazard. So the Combayi in South Carolina was the first one visited by the Spaniards in the year 1520. Vasco de Ayon, having discovered it, gave it the name River Jordan. 
Although subsequently renamed the Combayi, the stream now became a river Jordan literally for more than 750 Negroes who, under the leadership of Harriet Tubman and the auxiliary command of Colonel James Montgomery, delivered this number of blacks into the free lines. The river Jordan has, a biblical, has been in biblical history a reality, and in modern Negro illusion, modern in the 1850s, 60s rather, uh, a symbol of the banner between bondage and freedom, or the barrier, excuse me, between bondage and freedom. And it is an interesting coincidence, therefore, that the Kombayi campaign should be so parallel to the ancient situation. It's significant only as the only military engagement in American history wherein a woman, black or white, led the raid and under whose inspiration it was origin originated and conducted. <laughs> so, I'm going to skip the rest. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, the blacks in her, under her command would have been a combination of um, slaves who escaped to the Union lines as well as free northern blacks? Yes. Who would volunteer? Yes. Of which there were many. Yes. So, just to also put this in context, even though we're not in the, you know, we're not talking about the elections of uh, uh, 2004, but when we talk about free, pre, uh, screen right, pre-Civil War, free versus slave states, the red states being the slave states, and that's actually still the nomenclature that we use today, a red states versus blue states, right? So the 2000, so the, that's the 2004 general election presidential results. The 2008 electoral map. 2012 So with the exception of, you know, Virginia and Florida. So the Confederacy is not dead. So the Confederate battle flag is a potent symbol of white supremacy and also white supremacist movements. While masquerading as a simple nostalgic movement, it actually provides cover for a number of like organizations, including the National Rifle Association, also known by my parents as the Negro Removal Association, the Ku Klux Klan, American Nazi Party, Skinheads, Christian Identity, and other similar movements. So the Confederates, when we talk about God and country, America is a white Protestant, King James version of the Bible based traditional family values country, um, and this is often a value exposed by white separatists who basically, for example, want the Northwest, i.e. Oregon, Washington, Idaho, Montana, Wyoming as a whites only homeland. Part of the reason they want to do that is because of certain values that came out of the Confederacy. So just doing a Google search in terms of Confederates and patriotism. Actu patriotism actuated by a love of one's country. So that's pretty clear from the visual grammar what they consider to be their country. So for example, the American flag, the visual grammar of that, 13 stripes symbolizing the original 13 colonies, and from 13 colonies to one nation, and each star of course is a state, and Confederate battle flag, 13 states, like the 13 colonies, and the blood, I would assume, that's been shed. And if you overlay one over the other, kind of what comes through. I like to play with visuals. So gradually, the obvious Confederate imagery begins to fade away till it's almost gone, but oops. So Google on the word Patriot, an image, and this is what you come up with, right? 
So notice who's a patriot. And granted, this image is from the 50s. But when you talk about, oh, the good old days, and the good old days being the 50s, because, you know, the tumult of the 60s and the women's movement and etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Confederate American. <coughs> heritage, and they basically, you know, one counter to the charge of racism, oh, it's not heritage, it's hate. So, that heritage then, equality and the right to vote even for black Confederates? So, black Confederates? Remember, honor black Confederate soldiers. So, were they fighting for freedom and equality and the right to vote, and were they going to be granted that if the South had won? Hmm. There's actually a video on that. It's uh, actually kind of a... Um, Not, let's see, a satire or a spoof, the Confederate States of America. Called the Confederate States of America. You can find it on Netflix. I got it at Amazon. It basically is um, a, what if the South had won the Civil War? What would America look like? And so basically, it's kind of done like a network special with commercials. And one of the commercials is like for an insurance company where not only you're insuring your house and your boat and your car, you're also insuring your slaves. Because during this time, insurance companies actually did insure your slaves. Nathan Bedford Forrest, as we talked about the other day, Confederate general, military commander at Fort Pillow, and Forrest founded the Ku Klux Klan. Ride like you rode with Forrest. So, you know, the connection between Confederacy and Ku Klux Klan and racism is really and kind of not that far off. Preserving your heritage is not a hate crime. Pride, not prejudice. Stop Southern cultural cleansing. So what if your heritage was slave owning and what if I don't want to be a slave or for you to have slaves? So if you know, again, the states, for example, it's not racial, it's regional. So the states that are pictured here in the Confederacy, part of white supremacist movement is to claim certain areas as a whites only homeland. Outside of the states of the Confederacy, this is usually depicted as the Northwest, Oregon, Washington, Idaho, Montana. But notice they've started adding some states to their racial region, <coughs> their cultural region. So in this depiction, for example, Arizona and New Mexico seem to have been added to the Confederacy. So as an interesting meme, and then, so let's see, uh, screen, the top, screen top, redneck, then cowboys, then a rebel cowgirl. So cowboys have kind of emerged as one type of white supremacist youth gang here in Oregon, and this is starting, uh, Definitely back in the 80s and 90s. Gone kind of underground. Welcome to Dixie, don't stay long. Like or in Oregon, welcome to Oregon, spend money, then leave. <laughs> and again, the Confederacy seems to be expanding northwards. So that's in the past when sometimes when some, not all, only white folks, but other people basically say why when you bring up the immediate, recent, or distant past to illustrate that the past isn't past, it's also present. Injustices, they're also in denial about what it would mean because changing the status quo. 
So, black history is American history, and the principle or principles difference is, is that well is that we try and remember versus what is usually left out in mainstream. So, for example, Eugene history. So, as an example, all bomb threats and the Holt Center when we were having the Martin Luther King celebration, all bomb threats at the Holt Center have been African American related events, and I've been in fret, present at at least three or four of them. Uh, when the crowd was evacuated into the street. So, for example, the first event was a 1985 benefit by Oxfam America for famine relief in Ethiopia. It was a phone-in pledge event with uh, live music. Arzenia Richardson, who was a DJ, among other things, at KLCC, took the phone call in which a caller said he didn't he had placed a bomb in the Holt Center because he didn't like the fact that they were raising money for niggers in Africa. And he reported the quote verbatim to the register guard. And the guard reported the bomber was concerned that the event wasn't raising money for Oregon children. Which is a lie. So the caller didn't mention Oregon children at all, and why not simply report the facts as reported to you? So, it, you know, race still is an issue for local citizens, and are you surprised when your local newspaper lies when race is concerned? And that no reporter of color has lasted at the Register Guard longer than three to five years. And I'm thinking still to this day, Though they don't answer my inquiries. Like, what's your demographic? So, Mr. O President Obama said, had expressed in his first term admiration for Abraham Lincoln, particularly in his, quote, team of rivals, selection of former adversaries as advisors. Pundits have touted his election as the beginning of a post racial era beyond black power confrontational politics. So some of us, myself included, are working for an America that doesn't exist yet, where national security means every human being who wishes to contribute to the common good is considered a citizen, where everyone is clothed, fed, sheltered, and educated to the level necessary to support themselves, their families, and their mental, emotional, and spiritual health, as well as their deepest dreams. So it doesn't exist yet. Sometimes I had thought that Mr. Mr. Obama's America is a step towards that. But again, he's not a descendant of slaves. He doesn't weave in an emic that is an internal cultural analysis in his policy. Um, even though he does talk about Mount Luther King's mount, mountaintop speech and the 106-year-old black woman uniting others across differences royal worth. You may have seen me, um, the reason I'm going into this is that you may have seen me wear a sweatshirt or a t-shirt talking about University of the Hood. What this was, uh, and I don't know that it exists anymore because the web, well it existed one, for a time as a website. There was this brother from Los Angeles, part of the USC film school, who wanted to have, who was disturbed about the fact that there weren't any positive image movies for black people. And wanted to create one, and basically wanted to create a concept of a university of the hood where black, a historically black college could exist, where basically people would be dealing with issues of the day. And so this logo, basically what it has is an ankh, coming out of a lotus, love, power, uh, and I think life. You have winged pit bulls, that's what those animals are, and a gold braid. Where are the wings? What looks like water flowing from their shoulders is wings. Winged pit bulls. So, the University of the Hood is one of many names for the what I call the Indigenous African Empowerment Matrix, uh, 
which arose in response to chattel slavery beginning in 1619, sometimes known as old school. And it's passed on covertly from those who know to those who don't, but wish to. So the idea of like my parents calling themselves old school, but me not. But if this is sense, you grow up with, you know, common sense or mother wit or things like that. So it's lessons in the university of the hood are encoded in normal everyday speech, coded recursive symbology, and hidden history. So I don't think that web that uh, address is in existence anymore, but it used to be. So if you would lead a revolution or a revolution, study the tactics of those who came for, for before you successful or not. So for example, answering the question, what is your history? What is the history of the land that you're on? What is the history of the people whose land you are on if they are not around anymore? So if you haven't been here, for example, for a hundred generations, it's not your homeland yet. You're a newcomer. So how did your people before you deal with those people who were on the land before you were here? And what did you bring to the table? And what was here to be brought to the table? And what do you bring to the table now? So if we started, for example, with indigenous democracy, and then look at what the countries, like uh, not the countries, but the uh, groups like Iroquois, Six Nations, who had an indigenous form of democracy, how that got replaced with Greco-Roman male-dominant democracy. And when that started to change, uh, under what conditions did it start to change? What kind of freedom movements were there? So if a woman or, or, or women are leaders, how are things, for example, run? Who is included and who is excluded? So when we talk about started with uh, started the broadcast with like the new Jim Crow, it's looking at how people can be systematically excluded from citizenship in the guise of making it safe for everybody. So the civil war that nobody knows. I, I mentioned this before, but here's uh, where it is in to make our world anew. August 14th, 1862. We're in the Civil War now. Lincoln picks a group of free blacks, the first major kind of conference of black Americans with American president. Lincoln told the men it was their duty to leave America. Now, notice this was not in Steven Spielberg's movie called Lincoln. No such meeting like this was depicted. You and we, but this is his quote, you and we are of different races, have between us a broader difference than exists between almost any two races. Whether it is right or wrong, I need not discuss, but this physical difference is a great disadvantage to us both, as I think your race suffers very greatly, many of them by living among us, while our suffer suffers from your presence. Okay, so wait, this is the Lincoln that Barack Obama admires, and what, he doesn't know that this is <laughs> part of Lincoln's history? And imagine Lincoln saying this to Frederick Douglass, which is what's happening here. <laughs> In Lincoln's view, white people didn't want black people in America, and therefore black people would have to go. He proposed blacks settling in Central America, Costa Rica, a land rich in coal. He asked his visitors, Frederick Douglass among them, to help him find black settlers capable of thinking as white men. Free blacks organized protests and sent letters and petitions to the White House in response to this. 
A horse thief, so this is from Frederick Douglass. A horse thief, pleading that the existence of the horse is the apology for his theft, or a highwayman contending that the money in the traveler's pocket is the sole first cause of his robbery, are about as entitled to respect as the president's reasoning on this point. No, Mr. President, is not the innocent horse that makes the horse thief, nor the traveler's purse that makes the highway robber, and it is not the presence of the Negro that causes this foul and unnatural war, but the cruel and brutal cupidity, so cupidity in case you didn't know, is greed, especially for money or possessions, the, cu the brutal cupidity of those who wish to possess horses, money, and Negroes by means of theft, robbery, and rebellion. Call it like it is, Frederick. Lincoln barred blacks from the army in the Civil War, ordered fugitive slaves returned to their masters, and if slaves behind enemy lines revolted, the Union troops could fight the slaves, not the rebels. Remember, this is in the Constitution. Right? Federal authority to put down slave rebellions with an iron hand. Lincoln revoked a field proclamation of a general freeing slaves of Missouri rebels. So remember the Missouri Compromise, where there's no slavery north of the bottom of Missouri? Well, Missouri was clearly... Oh, Missouri is where Ferguson is. Huh. It seems that, just like in Mississippi, racism is a tradition. If you remember that Denzel movie, Mississippi Masala, and he said, his quote was, in, in, in Mississippi, what, uh, uh, what other people call racism, we call tradition here. So the idea that Lincoln freed the slaves, uh, no. <laughs> All right, so black... American history tells you Lincoln freed the slaves. Black history tells you, yeah, after we freed ourselves with a lot of help and not much of it from Lincoln. So, well, President Obama, post-racial Obama, may look at Lincoln for guidance. I don't think Lincoln can guide us to a post-racial society. So, in Dixie. So, you know, we won. We've won. So, for example, a lot of, uh, there was a lot of um, celebration at the first uh, election of President Obama. So, let's be clear, the electoral victory of him is historical, no question about it. But descendants of slaves know about history is different what Barack learned in any of his schools, particularly where that history was taught as American history and not black history. So, for example, uh, I ha used to sh show a uh, graphic of a photograph, but let's say that there are five worlds. And the five worlds are the viewer and their story, the story behind the story, what's being shown to you, the hero is the teller of the tale, and what is left out of what is being told in the tale. So I'm not telling you everything because <laughs> there's a lot to tell and you have to basically stick to uh, a certain narrative line even though I jump all around, right? So the point of view of the viewer, you, what is your history? What is your upbringing? What, ha ha what has it shaped you? What have you been shaped to believe? What is your confirmation bias? That is, you're part of a group with a worldview. When you hear things that contradict that worldview, do you challenge your worldview and disbelieve facts or adjust your worldview to the new facts? Assuming the facts <coughs> have been verified as facts. And the story behind the story, meaning you should learn for yourself what the story behind the story is. What's the name of the drinking gourd in its original context? That is the constellation. 
What are the names of drinking gourds in various cultures? Why are slaves going north? Why did Canada give sanctuary and protection to slaves? And why didn't Lincoln want to free the slaves? So let's try and begin to answer that. So what is being shown to you? So not only by the traditional canon, <coughs> but by myself and others. How does that fit in with what you know of the backstory? Do you know the backstory? And maybe you should check out the backstory, especially where there's a questionable history. So when I started out with the new Jim Crow, that's basically jumping in time to the current time and saying, OK, these policies have their roots and stuff that happened a long time ago and have been continuous. So the teller of the tale, what is their interest in telling you the tale? And what's being left out of what's being told in the tale? How does that change what you know? How does that conform, confirm your world, or does it change it? So a black president, and is he black enough? Or as it was one of the questions that was raised in his election, or is he Mandela enough? That is, black enough. Will he ask the questions, show the history, illuminate the path toward justice for all? That is, that path that white America may or may not want to see, or other parts of America. So not just making it a black-white binary. Post-racial, into dealing with class and other issues, other parts of the intersectional isms, other parts of other systems of discrimination. So black America has felt this jubilation before, a black president or savior. And also this fear for our shining princes and queens and leaders. So after the Civil War, during Reconstruction, So America is founded on preserving a labor force by dividing human beings against each other. Some people own things. Some people are considered things, not people. And this is a central problem which is still plaguing us today. As slavery is returned to America, a few acknowledge that, but not only do I digress, but I'm going to let you marinate on that and uh, bring it home. So there is civil rights struggle in Oregon. So there were racial exclusion laws that were selectively applied in the founding of this state. So for example, KJC, Knights of the Golden Circle, who they were was a pre-Ku Klux Klan group that their goal was basically a network of slave-holding states throughout Central America. And part of this slave-holding empire they wanted to create in Oregon was basically Douglas County and South. So if you've ever noticed that Douglas County and South in the I-5 corridor is much more conservative than North. Where exactly is Douglas County? Like? Douglas County is the next right. county down, and it basically starts, <coughs> you know, Rose basically. Or something? Uh, let's see, just like around Drain. Mm -hmm. If you're going down I-5, so it's like, you know, past Cottage Grove. Runs down to Sutherland. Yeah. Right. So they wanted to basically create a slave-owning state. Because remember, Oregon is created as an, a free state by banning black people. But some of these folks, the Knights of the Golden Circle, wanted a part of Oregon to be a slave state. And the people they wanted to enslave, of course, were black people, Native Americans, Chinese, Japanese, and Hawaiians. Around what period of time was it? Oh, well, this is, in, in, uh, this is the time of the founding of the state, right? So the Ku Klux Klan, so part of civil rights struggle in Oregon is understanding, like, you know, for example, Lane, 
General Joseph Lane of Lane County was an Indian fighter, that's why he was a general. His son-in-law was a Knight of the Golden Circle. Right? So part of this group that basically wanted to have a, I think, you know, there's a movie, uh, National Treasure or whatever, where it's talking about the Knights of the Golden Circle, you know, trying to have a plot to assassinate Lincoln, etc., etc. So the Ku Klux Klan was in operation into the 20th century and historically centered, for example, at the University of Oregon, county and city government, uh, in business, uh, the legal and political communities and law enforcement and education starting in the 20s, but also continuing to have influence here. And let's not forget Lane Community College as well, too. So, to give you some language that comes out of the civil rights <laughs> struggle, de facto, that is what's actually happening, and de jure, that is what is the law, segregation. So discrimination in housing, jobs, health care, and historical visibility in the curriculum. So part of what ethnic studies is about is increasing that historical visibility now and, in, and historically so that people have political viability in the present and in the future. So in Oregon there was both de facto and de jure segregation. So if you're visible in the past, you can be viable in the present and future. And if you can see yourself in the curriculum and develop skills from the curriculum, you can change the future. So African Americans, for example, in Oregon were present before the founding of the state. And who gets remembered, made visible, and who's forgotten in mainstream Oregon history. So there are the visible ones, for example, Marcus Lopez, who was Captain Gray's cabin boy, who was the considered in the historical record to be the first black person to set foot on Oregon, literally, on this ocean ship, and he was the cabin boy for this white sea captain, and he was killed by some Native Americans on the beach, I think near Tillamook. York, from the Lewis and Clark expedition, Lewis Clark, William Clark's uh, slave or manservant. Moses Black Harris, who we had talked about earlier, a trapper and wagon train scout. Jace, Jacob Vanderpool, a Salem, Oregon businessman deported in 1851 under the exclusion laws. And in Eugene, Wiley Griffin, and there are some other black people known throughout Oregon in a book called Peculiar Paradise, which is the history of blacks in Oregon. And Peculiar Paradise is online, uh, but it's mostly a Portland and Salem conversation. Eugene got left out of that conversation. Yeah. Where <coughs> in Oregon, like, where blacks first, you know, here? Where do they Oregon live in so terms of in numbers? Okay, so. With the founding of the city of Eugene, there were, according to the newspaper, something like 10 or 15 black people. Or they basically described a handful. So what is a handful? Okay, there are enough to say that there were several. There are enough to ask their opinion. Oh, you just got freed by Lincoln. You know, this is the Emancipation Proclamation. You just got freed, what's your opinion? You're free, sir. What's your opinion? Okay, so they report their opinion, but they don't name them. And part of why they don't name them is it's still illegal for them to be here. Right? Not that the register, or actually it's the morning register that said that, right? Because that was the Republican newspaper. So in Oregon, in Eugene, there was a Republican newspaper, the morning register, and then the Democrat newspaper, The Daily Guard. All right? So the Democrats were pro-slavery. Okay? Republicans were anti-slavery, the party of Lincoln. So when you have people like Frederick Douglass, they were Republican. Because there were very few, well, <laughs> in the South, blacks weren't allowed to vote, so they're not necessarily going to be, you know, Democrats. Right? 
And most black people were Republicans until 1930, which we're not going to get to until next mm -hmm. term. But there's reasons for that. I'm talking. But my question was so, like directly in terms of like location, in terms of like Eugene or Portland or Eugene, Salem, and Portland okay. were the centers of black community. Okay, so because if Jacob Vanderpool could own a business. Well, who's supporting the business? It isn't necessarily going to be black people, but because there are some black people coming in to Oregon. Like at the time of the exclusion laws, there's like 200 black people. Some answering the census, some not. Right? So if they're going to be centered, if you're not going to count the people in rural areas, so how do you distribute 200 people? That's probably going to be like Portland, Salem, and Eugene a little bit, but there might be other places. So scattered across, mm -hmm. historically. So African Americans were in its founding. Again, I just actually told you this. So the first Afri earliest African American to be publicly acknowledged by name uh, was Wiley Griffin. We talk about him yet? Yeah. Yeah. He was also referred to uh, <laughs> uh, as an obsequious Chesterfield, and this is part part of the um, story about. So, when this uh, obsequious Chesterfield, so one of the things in, in interrogating this particular um, phrase. So Wiley Griffin, the ebon-hued muleteer and obsequious Chesterfield of the system, vainly seeking to coax a spasmodic burst of speed out of the perverse long-eared critter that is the, the mule, was a common sight along the early street cow rat. Now, ebon-hued, he's black, obviously, right? Obsequious Chesterfield. So in order that he's basically, that's a racialized term, but it's not obvious. So, for example, if you try and Google on Chesterfield or look up the term, right, it's a couch. <laughs> or it's a coat. But obviously in the context, he ain't being called a couch or a coat. So you actually have to dig farther. Why Chesterfield? Well, it turns out, before, when this was written, Right, Eugene's trolley era, car trolley car era, the Lane County historian. So, when this is written, it's after World War II, but World War I is still in people's minds. Before World War I, so I'm a drug counselor, so I track historical uses of drugs, right? Marlboro's used to be a woman's cigarette. But they weren't selling. So they rebranded it and made it into a cowboy cigarette and sales sword. Right? And then they gave w women Virginia Slims and Eve and whatever other brands they have. Chesterfield, okay, was a black cigarette before menthol by Camel. Obsequious, right? So. Excessively eager to please, to obey all instructions, Chesterfield, sofa, style of overcoat. So, not in the dictionary. More black Americans smoke Chesterfield than any other cigarette until World War II. And part of how that changed was Lucky Strike, which was number two, waged a racial campaign where people would say, no, do you want Chesterfield? No, I don't smoke that nigger cigarette. And basically knock Chesterfield down to number three. I smoked him. And Lucky's. Yeah, and Lucky's. So we talked about Wiley Griffin, but I'll just leave this up. So Oregon's like a southern state in the Northwest. So unlike southern states where non-whites were second-class citizens, non-white American citizens of other states in the United States were forbidden to come to or remain in Oregon. 
though many did. So while many individuals like Moses Harris and Wiley Griffin were tolerated because they're not uppity, Eugene, before 65, was like a segregated southern town where blacks were not allowed to live within the city limits, could be subject to arrest on the street after dark, and were not allowed in many businesses. There was an active Ku Klux Klan, which historically had roots in county and city government, the Elks, American Legion, Chamber of Commerce, Rotary Club, and many other institutions. So there was a need for a civil rights struggle. So I'm jumping from Oregon now to one of the first black doctors in the Civil War era. So Martin Robeson Delaney, uh, who born, who born, born in the South, resorted to learning how to read and write when it was illegal. During, due to his continuous desire to learn, he settled in New York, where he attended the African Free School. So you should understand the first public schools were started by black people. First public schools in America were started by black people. And since other schools were racially segregated, the schools started by black people allowed poor whites to come to them. So between 1843 and 46, Delaney published his own newspaper, The Mystery. Subsequently, he worked with Frederick Douglass on his own, on Douglass's new weekly newspaper, The North Star. I trust you understand the imagery behind that. Delaney entered Harvard Medical School as one of its first black students. In 59, he traveled to Africa where he stayed for nearly a year searching for suitable locations for immigration. So notice this is still some time after the early immigration movements going to Liberia. On February 8th, during the Civil War, he received the first commission of major in the Federal Army, the first black man to receive, so the first black you know, major officer. He's an accomplished author, and his favorite subject was history. One of his books, Principia of Ethnology, The Origin of Races and Color, with an archaeological compendium of Ethiopian and Egyptian civilization from years of careful examination and inquiry, was published in 1879 and detailed the African origins of Nile Valley civilizations. The racial and historical consciousness of Delaney is apparent in the names he gave to his children. So remember I was talking about Toussaint Louverture, Ramses Placido, one of uh, Toussaint's kids, Ramses Placido, named after the mighty Egyptian pharaoh, Usamari Ramses, and the Cuban poet and revolutionary Gabriel de la Concepcion Valdez, who wrote under the pen name Placido. So Cuban poet and revolutionary. His other ch uh, children's names included Alexander Dumas, Saint Cyprian, and Toussaint Louverture. Frederick Douglass said of Delaney, I thank God for making me a man simply, but Delaney always thanks him for making him a black man. And one of his more famous works that you can also find online the Condition, Elevation, Immigration, and Destiny of the Colored Peoples of the United States Politically Considered. So he also ran for Lieutenant Governor as an Independent Republican, no, the party affiliation, in South Carolina. His bid for public office was unsuccessful. And uh, Blake or the Huts of America. So the hero of this novel, so this was written in um, 1859, Blake, a West Indian who traveled throughout the South advocating revolution and later became a general of an African insurrectionary force in Cuba. Blake hopes that with a victorious insurrection in Cuba and the expulsion of all Americans, Cuba's model African state will lead to the downfall of slavery in the United States. Hmm. Why Cuba? Hmm. 
So the historical experience of African American soldiers, uh, the Delaney sisters, uh, no relation to Martin Delaney, I don't think. I love America. I love this country, but this country doesn't always love me back. So Martin Delaney in the 54th, the 54th uh, depicted in uh, glory, Fort Pillow, Nathan Bedford Forrest, the kick, the, the commander, <laughs> Cathay Williams, who was a black woman who served cross-dressed as a man and fought in the army, the Buffalo Soldiers at uh, San Juan Hill in Puerto Rico uh, during the Spanish-American War, where they charged and took the, the hill under extreme machine gun fire, and later, like half an hour later, after they took the hill with staggering losses, Teddy Roosevelt and his Rough Riders rode up to the hill for the press, and then he dissed the courage of the Buffalo Soldiers. So soldiers who were often lynched in uniform for daring to walk, for example, on sidewalks, both in World War I and World War II. Uh, we haven't gotten to the Camp Van Dorn massacre. We will next term, and also the Port Chicago mutiny. But uh, during uh, segregation uh, which of the military, which continued through World War II, uh, the Tuskegee Airmen and the original Black Panthers were all, all black um, army units, one in uh, the, one in, when the Air Corps was not a separate a service from the Air Force, but the Air Corps f people flying airplanes was part of the army. The Black Panthers were as tanks under General Patton. And the Black Panthers were some of the people that liberated Auschwitz and other uh, Nazi war camps in their tanks. General Colin Powell, and Commander Chester Pierce um, and microaggressions. So this, these are some famous African American um, soldiers. I felt that no black history should really be done without talking about the Ku Klux Klan, where we have oppression by confusion. So when you want to hide the true origins and intentions of something, use obfuscation. So for example, most scholarly references to the Ku Klux Klan point out it's being rooted in harmless fun, engaged by those who have time on their hands after the war. Uh, yeah. Uh, but, but of course, recall Nathan, Nathan Bedford Forrest's actions at Fort Pillow. Now, if this is the founder of the Ku Klux Klan, how do you get to it being a harm, being rooted in harmless fun? Well, it has to be the writer. It has to be the teller of the tale. Okay? The Confederates lost, and they're not simply going to sit by and let their inferiors have an advantage. So the Ku Klux Klan was the outgrowth of peculiar, this is a quote, Peculiar conditions, social, civil, and political, which prevailed in the South from 1865 to 1869. So it was as much a product of those conditions as malaria is of a swamp and sun heat. Its birthplace was Pulaski, the capital of Giles, one of the southern tier of counties in Middle Tennessee. Pulaski is a town of 2,500 to 3,000 inhabitants. Previous to the war, the people possessed wealth and culture. The first wealth was lost in the general wreck of the war. Now the most intimate association, association with them fails to disclose a trace of, di of the diabolism which according to the popular idea would, one would expect to find characteristic of the people among whom the Klan originated. A male college and a female seminary are located in Pulaski and received liberal patronage. It's a town of churches. There, in 1866, the name Ku Klux first fell from human lips. There began a movement which a short time spread as far north as Virginia and as far south as Texas. Now this is talking about the first part 
of the Klan in the late 19th century, which does not talk about the second resurgence of the Klan in the early 20th century to the present day. So by looking at some of the historical roots and some of the things where policy-wise, why would this take root in Oregon? What is its relationship to a group like the Knights of the Golden Circle? And how do they then create uh, public policy in the state of Oregon? So there began a movement which in a short time spread as far south and far north as Virginia and as far south as Texas and which for a period con convulsed the country. Proclamations were fulminated against the Klan by the president and by the governors of states and hostile statutes were enacted by both states and national legislatures for they had become associated with the name of the Ku Klux Klan, gross mistakes and lawless deeds of violence. Now, we're talking about in the time of its origin outside of the South. During the entire period of the Klan's organized existence, Pulaski continued to be its central seat of authority and some of its highest officers resided there. This narrative, therefore, will relate principally to the growth of the Klan and the measures taken to suppress it in its home state of Tennessee. Now, the reason I'm showing this narrative about the beginning of the Klan in its home state. So they're saying that it met resistance. It was a social club. There are people that would basically say that, oh, it was a social club. You know, you, if you want to be in business, you had to be a Klan member. And it was kind of like being in the Rotary or the Chamber of Commerce. You know, it's all in good fun, right? And so you see, even with this writer, when they're talking about the first part of the Klan, they're not necessarily talking about homegrown terrorism. So the first period covers the time from its organization in 1866 to the summer of 1867. So wait a minute, a year? <laughs> and when the war ended, the young men of Pulaski escaped death on the battlefield, returned home, passed through a period of enforced inactivity, and this is basically what's going to set up the nastiness of Reconstruction. So I'm going to put the rest of this up, and uh, we'll continue All next right. week. Yes.